Welcome to the SOB Radio Show, where we have fun, interesting guests, and hot topics. Each week, we offer insights into music, fashion, health, fitness, and humor. Do you have the perfect guest for us to interview? I want to know. Drop me a line on our Facebook page at Spunky Old Broad 1, or reach out to me on our website at SpunkyOldBroad.com. And now, back to the show. Hi, everybody. We have a delightful show for you today. My guest is Dr. Cheryl Shire. She grew up in a creative entrepreneurial family and managed her own accounting and tax business for over 17 years. When she became a single parent, she went back into corporate as a financial consultant and management. Cheryl's experience exposed her to the dark side of wealth as ethics, integrity, violations, and illegal behavior. After winning a lawsuit against one of the unscrupulous companies, she began to write her books, Wealth Transformation, Integrity, 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 which became the basis of her long-running Marin TV show, Wake Up with Dr. Cheryl. She has a BS in Business Administration, an MBA in Finance, and a PhD in Financial Management and Business Administration. Welcome to the show, Dr. Shire, and I will call you Cheryl from now on. How are you? Please. Oh, Gail, it's an honor to be here, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, it's really interesting, you know, when you talk about the fact of um, your background in finance and then, um, you know, experience what you call the dark side of wealth. You know, now they call it the dark side of the web and everything else, but it's really amazing how few companies, whether they're in the financial arena or not, really have this high ethics strategy. It's just like I was at an event uh, this past weekend, and they were uh, talking about, you know, this whole college scandal thing. And um, the fact that there are so many avenues today for people without a college degree, that if colleges offered certificates or any kind of school offered certificates in particular arenas, people would be much better off, get to work faster, have less debt, and yet corporate America wants the MBAers. So, um, you know, it's kind of a conundrum, which is, which is interesting. But let's get into your, your story. <laughs> so tell us about what mental programming you had growing up about wealth and money. Well, my, um, I lived in an upper-middle-class area. My dad was an engineer with Boeing. My mother did go back to work, um, and she did quite well. Um, but they didn't know how to manage money. Uh, they did the best they could with the education they had. Uh, but I always had my grandmother saying to me, save your money, save your money. And it became in my subconscious because I'm always good about saving money and looking for the best price for everything, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, I have been through a lot of challenges in that financial world. Hmm. Uh, well, where to start? Um you know, I've I've helped people manage their money, and I what what threw me off <clears throat> is not really what it came down to is not trusting myself. I've trusted the wrong people, and I got scammed. Um, I've I've lost a lot of money. I've had to file bankruptcy, uh, which I you know being in the financial industry is not very good but it is what it is and it's in the past and thank god it, it you know it won't happen again um but the lessons that i've learned and it was a hard lesson is trusting myself and having the right professionals around me um for guidance that's interesting because um you know it's amazing how many successful people today have gone bankrupt <laughs> you know, but the thing is, they haven't let it stop them. They haven't let it yeah. uh, define who they were. And that's exactly what you did. You just oh. said, OK, I've been through all this crap, but yeah. I've got to I've got to pick myself up and, and uh, deal with this. And yet here you were really good about saving money, but you listened to the wrong people. So how does someone find the right person? How do you know? I mean, if someone talks a great game, uh, but, 
you know, they're just not who you think they are. How on earth do you find that out? Well, you know, hopefully it's through somebody that you that's credible around you in your peers or your professional. I mean, that to me, not that that's going to be 100 percent, but what it really what it comes down to is trusting your own intuition, which, you know, I've had to learn uh, over the years is trusting it. And, and you know, basically, um, that's it. Trusting your own intuition and your through your experience, et cetera. So, you know, did you, would you say that you are the one who influenced you the most with your wealth and money, or was it someone else? Did you have a, a great mentor? Well, I, I have used, per, you know, <laughs> gosh, um, I have studied um, Deepak Chopra and his wealth theories. I have studied Warren Buffett. Uh, I, I make it, um, you know, part of my criteria of investing, et cetera, is looking at the pros that have made it. And, of course, I know today things are just changing so rapidly, and it's hard. It's hard. I mean, but I always look for successful, financially successful people. So so how did what you learned from Deepak Chopra and Warren Buffett, who are certainly two great examples, uh, how did you, what, how did they influence you? What, what did you uh, take action on from what you learned from them? Well, because certainly there's two different styles there. I mean, yes. Chopra and Buffett, you couldn't get more two diverse people. So I'm curious as to how you put it together. Well, you know, I guess that's how I put my business together too is I have this left brain and the right, the right kind of extreme right brain too. And the one thing I learned from Deepak is, or, you know, at least I, I'm implementing it throughout my own psyche is, you know, fear is around money is one of the biggest factors. And, you know, fear is of course, false expectations appearing real. And what I really got is there's more than enough. If you are budgeting yourself, you're managing your money, you there's more than enough. There's and that also, you know, there's lots of levels of getting to that point. And I think it's a spiritual level as well, or metaphysical, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, trusting yourself, trusting the people that you look to for mentors. Um and as far as Warren Buffett, I'm I'm not a big proponent myself of investing in the market, but I think he he has a, a, a foundation of you know practical uh, business acumen. So to me, you've got to have that strong foundation of practicality, and of course drive. Um, but those are the kind of things, and I especially think that the most important thing is is the fear the fear factor and not allowing that to rule you. But you also not only went bankrupt once, you went bankrupt twice. Is that correct? That is correct. And the first time was my marriage. Um, I unfortunately, um, my former husband grew up with a very wealthy family, but he never knew how to uh, manage it. So, and I take responsibility for my part of that. The second time I trusted an investor who, uh, well, it ended up really bad. So um, those are the two uh, kind of reasons why I went into it. The second one with that investor, I did not, trust my own intuition if i had, i mean i even called a, a friend of mine that was with aig who knew how to do background checks internationally oh. i had him check it out he said oh the guy's okay well a couple months down the road he says you better run <laughs> well I, I didn't run fast enough but anyway that's you know these are the levels that i have to learn on or i did learn on and so that's what it is. <laughs> so let me ask you, this is a show for women over 50. How old were you when these two bankruptcies took effect? Oh, gosh. Um, in my 30s. 
Yeah. Both of them or, or no, one of them? One of them was in my 30s. The other one was probably in my 40s. Okay. So um, uh, we shall we share how old you are, Cheryl, or no? Mm, no. <laughs> just say, okay, we'll just say you're over 50. But yeah. you've learned your lesson and you're okay financially now, correct? Yes. I'm I'm in a place where I feel comfortable. I Certainly my goals... Uh, outreach that where I am today, but I'm working on it. Okay. So let's say, because, you know, women are listening and they're saying, okay, you know, I've hit 50, I've hit 60, whatever I am. And I, I'm not, not sure I'm going to have enough money to live on, you know, for the rest of my life. And what are some suggestions that you give to women who are 50 and above uh, as to take them where they think they need to go. I mean, certainly not to be at the top of the food chain, but, you know, enough to take care of themselves. And if they don't know how to do it, what what would be your suggestions to them? Well, you know, I had um, a in, uh, retired investment banker on my show from Barclays. And one of the best things he said, and this applies to all of us, and I guess I'm bringing this up so you can take an inventory of your thoughts and your actions is, you know, what can you do without? I, I'm a big proponent, I guess, because I've been in business, you know, I've been an entrepreneur for so long. I always look at need. I don't always, always look at want. I mean, depending on my situation, but I think it's important to, you know, have a budget. You need to be realistic with what your income is or potentially making more income at, 50, 60, because, you know, people are not retiring as young as they used to. And they have, they're vital. I think it's important to, do, you know, live your purpose and your passion. And if you can monetize, when you can monetize that, then you can feel comfortable. And, you know, you can work when you want and, and work when you don't want. You know, if you are, like, on Social Security or whatever. I mean, there's lots of levels to it. So it, there isn't a one straight answer but mentality is extremely important it's not feeling like there's not enough so should a person like that go to a financial advisor and figure out you know say i've got you know five dollars a week to invest or i've got fifty dollars a week to invest or i mean how i'm just trying to think uh because there are people that say you know there's just no hope for me so what would what would step number one be? Well, you know, <laughs> I always say baby steps are better than no steps. And you don't have to take big strides. But I think taking that first step, no matter how much money it is. I mean, I know most advisors, you know, especially in the, the market, they don't want to take anything under, you know, $1,000, $500, whatever. Um, I just talked to somebody recently that, you know, 500 is like, well, that's nothing. But it is something for the person that wants to invest. So finding the right the right ones, and it's not an, I don't think it's easy, but there again, if you know people that you can get referrals, that that also helps. So one baby step at a time. Okay, so um, why and how? Did you become an entrepreneur? Well, first you really were an entrepreneur, and then you went to uh, corporate America, which um, is is curious. You know, you say that uh, you did it because you were a single parent, uh, but then again, you know, as an entrepreneur, uh, you might have been able to make it as a single parent, um, and then you went back to being an entrepreneur. So, tell us a little bit about that journey. Well, <clears throat> just see, so I'll, I'll do a quick recap on my my working uh, history is okay. <clears throat> my dad was an engineer with Boeing and he was laid off when I was about 14 and he started his own business, which was in the auto auto industry. Um, so I got involved with that. So I got a taste. Of course I, I, you know, did babysitting when I was 10. I did everything I could to, to make money. Um, and, and buy what I wanted at the time. But anyway, um, from from there, I worked with my dad's business, and then I went into banking. I was in banking for four years. Um, I had a 
I was a protege of a real good manager uh, when I worked for, uh, well, now it's Bank of America, but it was Seattle First National Bank. Anyway, from there, I decided, well, you know, I need to, I was working for a construction company. Um, and then I decided, oh, I've got to get out on my own. So I started step by step by getting into bookkeeping. And I was also educating myself um, during this time. And so then I started doing the accounting and, you know, interpreting financials for people, putting the financials together for, you know, 17 years or so. Um, so, you know, it's just step by step and, you know, listen to what your goal is, listen to what your passion and your purpose is and, and taking it from there. And so you went back then at that point into corporate America? Is that when you did that? Well, I, I had my own business and then I, I went through a really bad divorce, which cost me, you know, <laughs> cost me a lot. And I actually was at a point when I was pregnant and I only had six cents to my name. And I got down on my knees and I prayed, you know. And so that that was like a pivot for me to trust the universe that I will be taken care of. Not that I'm, I'm, I'm very action oriented and I'm driven. So I knew that I, I would just have to keep going. So at that point I was pregnant and then I, I kept my business for quite a while, but then I noticed that the, there was a shift, a trend that was shifting in the clients that I had that they wanted to do their internal um, accounting internally. So it was, it was time for me to, to look at things differently. So I went, that's when I went back into the corporate arena and I'll tell you what, you know, the unethical <laughs> behavior, et cetera. And that's not how I play. Um, you know, there's a game to play and you do it right. Um, but I went back into the corporate arena and saw so much, uh, I just, it's appalling. And, and I believe that's not to outreach our subject, but that's why I think our country and the world is in such a deep um, transition is because there's been so much greed and lack of, of ethics and integrity. Yeah, it's, um, well, I don't disagree with you. <laughs> I happen to agree with you. However, um you know, it's up to us and especially uh, the young people coming up who are, you know, really entrepreneurial, much more entrepreneurial than than in your stage and my stage. Uh, but still, they um, it's up to them. They can make a big uh, change in all of that. Well, but, uh, we the people. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so um, so your whole background was in finance. Uh, although when you worked with your dad, you know, at the young age of 14, were you handling dollars and cents then or were you doing something totally different? Um, yes, I, I would uh, <laughs> I would do inventory and he had a whole warehouse full of parts. Which I decided at that point, I don't like doing inventory. <laughs> it takes too long and you have to count one, two, three. Anyway, um, you know, I... I, I think that it gave me a foundation of, yes, I handled cash, I handled the customers. It was pretty well-rounded. So, you know, I, I feel very grateful. Um, however, I didn't want to stay in that business, um, which is probably to my father's chagrin. But um, I, I needed more. I needed, I needed a bigger situation because I think big and... He gave me the book, The Magic of Thinking Big. And so it definitely has impacted my psyche. Um, so. Um, well, that's interesting. I mean, it's it's um, first of all, it's it's wonderful that that your dad brought you into the business, because as a woman, uh, that's not necessarily what a parent would do. So that was really terrific. And I know that I used to go down, my father was a pharmacist and a, in a very small town. I think the whole town was maybe 10,000 people. And, but he was like the town doctor, mm -hmm. but he had a soda fountain 
in his drugstore. And I used to go behind the soda fountain and make the, the sundaes and the sodas and all of those kinds of things. And I thought, I mean, I got the biggest kick out of it. Well, yeah. And, you know, okay. and then I, I would help him with the inventory also, but mostly mine was unpacking, putting it on shelves. Right. And, uh, but it was, it was interesting to me. However, my entire uh, life, you know, uh, at that point was, was theater and performing and, uh, all of that, that I guess I'm still doing today, you know, but, um, uh, that was really my love. I mean, my love was always performing. So it's, it's interesting. That's where you got your start. You learned a lot from your dad and then you went into the finance industry. So what are you doing now, Cheryl? Tell us about what you're doing now. Well, I have had, um, a running, television show, TV show, for uh, almost seven years. And uh, I'm extremely, I, I love it. And um, but then I found the podcasting. And so I'm going to be launching my podcast. And because I have 100 and, 177 shows that we've produced. And um, anyway, so what I'm doing is my TV show. And I work with a, a public access, so I'm not making any money. So I do consulting on the side. And um, I'm looking forward to expanding on my podcast so I can start making, you know, the money that I have in my goal. Fantastic. That's great. So, you know, where would you say, um, well, first of all, what is your TV show about? Oh, <laughs> well, it's it's actually it's right in the avenue of this. Um, it's it's actually the raising the awareness and the unconscious subconscious mind in that relationship with wealth. And I threw in their unconditional love. So I think I'm going to have to have two shows here. But my show covers both because wealth covers so many avenues in our life. I mean, I've, I've had health shows, I've had wealth shows, because a lot of them, most of them tie into some sort of money. Um, I've had um, love. I, I just had a gentleman on my show, Safe to Love Again. He finished his book, and what a, a plethora of wonderful uh, information. So it's kind of well-rounded, but I focus on the wealth of of your health, your money, um you know, I mean, lots of, I mean, I've got a plethora of shows and it's, they're all helping humanity and that's what it's about. Well, you know, it's interesting because um, uh, I'm glad that you brought in the fact that wealth is not just about money because, you know, it's like when somebody says, what does success mean to you? It's like, well, it, it could be uh, raising a great family. It could be, um, you know, being uh, in my profession and having an impact that other people haven't been able to have it could be I mean it could be a whole bunch of things yeah, yeah. because I don't think of success as just well you know I'm making a million dollars a year uh, because I'm not making a million dollars a year but success is if you're having an impact and if you're having a positive one well, so it's wonderful to know that wealth comes in a lot of different uh, flavors it doesn't yeah. just have to be dollar bills and um, you know that I think is is really important so um uh, you have this um, TV show, and we have about two minutes left in this segment, um, Cheryl. Do you, what kind of response, because this is public TV, uh, what, what kind of response have you had from your audience? Well, <laughs> if I'm out and about, now I've lived in Marin uh, County in, uh, for, gosh, 28 years. Uh, I've had people walk up to me in the store. I've had people walk up to me in the street, um, several times in the street, you know, say, oh, my God, I love your show. You know, and that because we don't have the funding to do the um, rating on our on our TV station, um, I really don't know. But, it, of course, all my shows have been on YouTube. And uh, I did a, a show with Dr. John Gray, you know, Mars Venus. And I know that that show in particular was well over 6,000 uh, viewers. So, you know, it's, um, I mean, I love it. I love doing it because it brings out the best in people as well. 
and they can, you know, shed light and be an example for my viewers and listeners. Well, that's great because I know that, um, you know, when you have people who are following you, it, it that's that's success in itself, and it's very gratifying to know that um, there are people who are recognizing you and valuing what you have to say, which is the the key point. You know, is valuing Absolutely. what it is you have to say. You know, and it's, it's a, so well, it makes can, you know if I can spur one one thought that will help somebody. I'm happy. Exactly. I, I don't disagree with you at all. Well, it's been very, very interesting so far, Dr. Cheryl. <laughs> and uh, we're coming to the end of part one of our show. I hope everybody will stay tuned for, for part two. My guest is Dr. Cheryl Shire, and she is a uh, financial uh, management person and is someone who is very interested in doing it the right way with ethics and integrity. So stay tuned and we will be right back. <laughs> 